Now, throughout this Beach Life series, we've been exploring the mission of Jesus. Last year, we spent the entire year in the Gospel of Luke, and we saw the mission of Jesus firsthand. Jesus was very clear about his mission. He, he came to seek and save the lost. That's what Jesus came to do. And when he left the earth, he told his disciples, he told his followers that his mission is now their mission. And what we see happen in the, the, the letter to Acts and throughout the rest of the New Testament is people following the mission of Jesus and leading other people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Some people think that it's just about our speech. Well, you gotta be telling others about Jesus. And there are some people that wag their fingers and shame the church for not telling others about Jesus. I will tell you this. There are some people that are gifted and they are able to communicate hope in Jesus. They're able to communicate their testimony easily. But I believe the very best way to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus is through living out the same values that Jesus lived out when he walked on this planet. Jesus lived out love to lead people to Jesus. In 1 John 2, 6, one of the apostles wrote, well, John the apostle wrote, whoever claims to live in God must live their lives as Jesus did. So if we want to be a part of Jesus' mission, if we want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, then we have to live our lives as Jesus did. And that means we take the same values that Jesus demonstrated in life and we apply them to our lives. Our character changes. And as our character is transformed, as our character is changing, then... We're loving people the way God intended us to love people and we're leading people to Jesus. And it's a pretty awesome thing. So our guiding values here at Beach Church, we have five of them and they're modeled after the life of Jesus. The first guiding value is life-changing truth. The second is transparent living. The third is uncomfortable grace and that's what we're talking about today. The fourth is captivating celebration. And the fifth is selfless service. Today, we're talking about our third guiding value of uncomfortable grace. Last week, we talked about transparent living. And the truth is, when it comes to transparent living, we believe that God desires us to be real, open, and honest about who we are and we allow others to do the same. And if we're really practicing transparent living, we must also practice uncomfortable grace. Because if people are being real open and honest about who they are, that means they're, they're sharing their wins and they're sharing their victories, but it also means they're sharing their temptations and they're sharing their struggles with sin. And as people share about who they really are, we get to demonstrate uncomfortable grace. When you share your struggles, we get to share uncomfortable grace to you. We demonstrate grace in such a way other people might get a little bit uncomfortable. We demonstrate grace in such a way that we show the same love that Jesus had for other people. Imagine what would happen if somebody shared transparently about their struggles and their sin, what they were wrestling with in life, and we responded with criticism and judgment. Would they share again? No. And you know what would happen? Eventually, we would become a Ken and Barbie church. We would have the appearance everybody's coming because we all live perfect lives and we're not dealing with the nitty gritty of life. We're not really wrestling with who we really are. Instead, we're, we're settling for a superficial, glamorous appearance instead of allowing the truth of God's word to transform us and change us. So... That's why we believe the definition of uncomfortable grace, followers of Jesus give the same limitless grace they have received from God. 
followers of Jesus give the same limitless grace they have received from God. Now, if you are already a follower of Jesus, the grace that God has given to you is not just for you. It's for you to give to other people. God has accepted you. He has demonstrated grace to you. Therefore, you demonstrate grace to other people. Let's read together from Colossians chapter three, beginning in verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive other people or you must forgive others. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, the two words, uncomfortable and grace, don't really go well together. I mean, the word uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable implies this awkwardness. It, it, it implies a sense of uneasiness. If somebody makes you uncomfortable, you get up and move to another seat. If, if your bed is uncomfortable, you throw it out and you buy a new mattress. If your uh, whatever, if something is uncomfortable, clothes are uncomfortable, you change your clothes. We don't like feeling awkward and uneasy. That's one of the reasons why we don't do a stand up and meet your neighbor time here at the church. Because a lot of people feel uncomfortable about that. They, they feel awkward. Uh, hello, my name is Joe. Yes, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. And did they really mean it? You know, you just go back to your seat. It's, a, it's an awkward time for many people, so we don't do that. Why? Because we want people to be comfortable. The idea that grace is uncomfortable strikes us a little bit odd. We're taught that grace is wonderful, and it is. We're taught that grace is comforting, and it is. We're taught that grace is amazing, and it is. When we pray for other people, we often pray that they would experience the grace of God in their lives because God's grace is a good thing. But what is grace? The word for grace can be pretty confusing, especially for people that don't have a churched background. Uh, for instance, I, I grew up Catholic and my family at every meal in the evenings would say grace. We would bow our heads and somebody would say, or we would all say together, Bless us, O Lord, for these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord, amen. Raise your hand if you grew up saying grace or, or calling that mealtime prayer grace. Then after I surrendered my life to Jesus, I started running with different circles of followers of Christ. I received forgiveness for my sins. And as I was running with different churchy people, they used the word grace differently. The mealtime prayer was no longer called grace. That was for the Catholics and for the Clark W. Griswold family. That's what they did. Now, because I was born again, we bowed our heads at mealtime for the blessing. And we would ask God to bless the food and we would say, who wants to say the blessing? So for the sake of the message today, grace is not referring to a mealtime prayer. Grace is not referring to a young woman in the congregation who right now feels very uncomfortable. <laughs> you can jot this down in your life notes. God's grace is best described as God's goodness to those who deserve punishment. God's goodness to those who deserve punishment. I deserve to be punished for my sin. I am 51 years old. I have been alive 
for 18,702 days. Now, I don't keep track of the days. I jumped online, found a calculator to calculate the number of days I've been alive. 18,702 days. I have sinned quite a bit in my lifetime. During my time here on this earth, I have lied, I have stolen, I have cheated, I've looked at pornography, I've hated other people, I've been drunk, I have lost my temper, I've been arrogant, I've been filled with pride, I've wanted the spotlight on me rather than on God, I've been selfish, I've been rude, I've been impatient with other people. I've held grudges against others in my heart. I, I've not helped somebody when they needed it most. I've not cared for my body. I've not cared for my family. I've not carried, cared for my church the way I should. I've used the name of Jesus as a cuss word. I've openly mocked followers of Jesus for following Jesus. I've not worshiped God. I've not lived for God. I've not loved other people the way that I should. Raise your hand if you know somebody guilty of most of those things on that list. Raise your hand if it's the person in front of you. <laughs> people on the back row are like, yes. <laughs> I deserve to be punished for my sin. I deserve to be punished for my rebellion against the creator, the God that created me, the God who gave me life. I deserve to be punished. He says this in Ezekiel 18, four, all people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike, and this is my rule. The person who sins is the one who will die. All people belong to God. And since all people belong to him, he makes the rules and his rule is simple. The one who sins is the one who dies. The punishment that I deserve for my rebellion against God is death. And not only do I deserve to die physically in this life. I deserve to be tormented for all eternity in a hell. I deserve to be tortured and tormented by flames that do not consume. I deserve to experience that separation of God for all eternity because of my sin. By a fire that is so awful, the flames never consume what they burn and they burn me. I deserve that. And so do you. Let that sink in for just a moment. You deserve to be punished for your sin. When you accept the weight of that statement, then you best understand how life-changing God's grace can be. See, when you understand you deserve to be punished for your sins and that you deserve hell for all of eternity, then you understand how amazing God's grace is. God's goodness is not punishing us by giving us what we deserve. Now, God's justice demands punishment for sin. But God's love caused the Son of God to say, I will pay the price for sin. God's love said, I will die on the cross for sin. 
I accept the punishment for sin. God's justice required a price I could not pay. But because he makes the rules, he declares what's right. And he said, I deserve to die. And Jesus said, I die for you. Jesus chose to pay the price for our sin. The price was paid. The debt was satisfied. The relationship of God with his people was redeemed and it was restored. That's why grace is so amazing. That's why grace is so awesome. The lyrics from the hymn, Amazing Grace, say it best. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. So if you feel hopeless, if you feel discouraged, if you feel overwhelmed, if you wake up every morning and the, the weight of your past sin just presses down on you and you feel like you can't get out of bed because you've caused so much harm in your life to other people because of your sin, if you feel every day like you are a failure in life and that all you will ever be in your future is a failure because of your past, if you think God will never forgive you for what you've done, then look down in your life notes and ask yourself this question, which one of your sins will God not forgive? Which one of your sins will God not forgive? forgive. Which one of your sins do you think God is holding against you? Have you done something or damaged somebody so much you think God will not forgive you for that sin? Do you wake up every day with that regret and with that shame? Do you go through pill after pill trying to avoid trying to find peace? Do you go through bottle after bottle trying to forget the pain you caused? You do not have to live like that. God has something far better for you. It's called freedom. See, you don't have to be weighed down by the sin of your past. God's goodness toward you cannot fail. God's goodness toward you, demonstrated by what Jesus did on the cross, cannot be watered down. God's goodness cannot be explained away. It cannot be watered down. God's goodness cannot be made powerless. Jesus has set you free from your sin, and that means he has also set you free from shame, set you free from guilt, set you free from fear, set you free from doubt, set you free from your past mistakes and from your insecurities. Jesus has set you free, so stop chaining yourself down to what he has freed you from. Live in freedom. And that means you demonstrate uncomfortable grace to others. See, as, as you live out uncomfortable grace in your own life, ask yourself this question, do you allow others space to fail? Do you allow others the space to fail? Does everybody around you have to be perfect? Do you have such a high standard for your children and for your, your marriage and for your neighbors that, man, when that neighbor leaves that trash can out an extra day, it just gets under your skin? Does everybody around you have to be and live perfect? Do you allow others the freedom and space to fail? Do you criticize people when they mess up? Do you harp on people because 
They've made poor choices in their lives. Do you whisper about the teenage girl that got pregnant? Do you whisper about the mother that drinks too much? Do you whisper about the parent that loses their temper in the grocery store? Do you gossip about the neighbor's choice of swimwear at the beach? And you say, she's 95 years old. She should not be wearing that bikini. Our 95-year-old thought that was really funny. <laughs> we all live imperfectly. We all make mistakes. We all sin. So give space to those around you and let them fail without judging them. Demonstrate God's grace so much to others that it does make other people uncomfortable. Now let's loop back to transparent living as we talked about last week. If people are free to be open and honest about who they are, and we allow other people to do the same, if you are free to be open and honest about who you are, if we allow other people to do the same, then we must show grace. Because if you're honest about your imperfections, then other people get to be honest too. And that's where this whole concept of uncomfortable grace comes from. If someone chooses to not live transparently, they're not going to receive uncomfortable grace. But if people are open and honest about who they are, then we get to show grace. We're building a culture here at Beach Church where other people don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. When people are open and honest about who they are, they're asking for help. They're looking for accountability, but they won't be looking for it if we respond with criticism and a judgmental attitude. So as people live transparently, we're called to show the same uncomfortable grace that Jesus showed. When he lived on the earth, the Pharisees and the religious leaders said, why do you hang out with such scum? Jesus hung out with the prostitutes. They didn't pretend that they were somebody that they weren't. Everybody knew and their mamas knew who they were. The tax collectors were cheats and thieves. They betrayed their own people by working for the Roman government and charging people an exorbitant amount of money that they didn't have to. The tax collectors never pretended to be somebody they weren't. So the religious leaders went to Jesus and said, why do you hang out with such scum? I am glad Jesus likes hanging out with scum, aren't you? Amen. I'm glad that Jesus likes hanging out with people like me. I'm glad that he was willing to give up his life for me. And I'm glad that he was willing to pay the price that I could not pay. So be open and honest about who you really are. Live transparently. And we know that as you live with transparency, you're not content with just living, that you want to press into God's word and you want to become the person God's created you to be. You have the freedom to take your own pace at becoming the person God has created you to be. As I move to close out this message, sometimes there are people that think they're experiencing God's grace because they got goosebumps during a message or because they started attending church or because they started carrying a Bible or reading their Bible and, and they think that, man, I've, I've, I'm changing. I'm becoming someone different. And that could be the case. If you're on that journey, understand attending church doesn't change your heart. Amen. 
putting on the right clothes and saying the right things, whatever those right things are. If you know what those right things are, please tell me so I can start saying them. <laughs> putting on the, the, the air that you've, I am going to church now. I'm changed. It's like going camping. I, Christy loves going camping. She loves it. She's always talking to me. This is about the time of year in the springtime. I guess we're in the summertime, so maybe I made it. Christy loves camping. I can take it or leave it. I, I, okay, it's a nice idea one night, but she's like, let's do seven nights. I, I like the campfire. I hate the smoke. I like being outside. I hate the mosquitoes. Like it's just, you know, I get mosquito bit all three days, four days, and I have to live with that for the next nine weeks of my life because I keep scratching and doesn't heal. I, but I love building a fire. I just hate the smoke that goes along with it. It soaks into everything on a camping trip. It soaks into my beard. It soaks into my hair. It soaks into my skin. It soaks into my clothes, my sleeping bag, my tent. It doesn't matter. I go to the, the, the showers and I shower and then I put on my smoky clothes again. And I'm just stinking, smelling like smoke. When we leave, the, I can't wait to jump in the shower, burn those clothes, and put on fresh clothes. I love to be clean after going camping. There are some people that attend church and read their Bible. They're putting on these clothes thinking that the stink of their sin has been washed away, but it hasn't. There are some people that are still walking with that stench of sin in their lives. I lived like that until I was 18 years old and somebody invited me to go to church and I heard the gospel. I'd always believed about Jesus. I always believed Jesus. I always understood that Jesus died on the cross and paid the price for my sin. I always believed that Jesus rose from the dead. I always believed that one day he's going to return. But that belief didn't change me. When I surrendered my life to Jesus, that changed me. There are some people that are going to miss heaven by about a foot. They believe in their head, but they've never surrendered with their heart. And if that's you today, understand you can do and say all the right things, but you're still going to pay the price for your sin if you've never surrendered and your heart to Jesus and received him as your savior. I want to help you with that. On the screen, there is a prayer of surrender. This is similar to what I prayed the day I gave my life to Jesus. I prayed something like, thank you, God, for creating me. I admit that I have sinned. I deserve to be punished for my sin. Thank you that Jesus paid the punishment for me I deserved on the cross. I believe Jesus died, rose from the dead, and will one day return. I surrender my life to you and receive Jesus as my Savior. You might say, Pastor Joe, how can I be saved if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess these words with your mouth and you believe them in your heart, you will be saved. You will be forgiven. You will not have to experience punishment for your sin. I want to invite you in your own way, make those words on the screen yours. Surrender your life to Jesus. Be cleansed on the inside. You've been attending church. You've been reading your Bible. Now let Jesus change you on the inside. Let him make you new.
And if you're still unsure about whether or not you've surrendered your life to Jesus, our prayer team is gonna be here at the close of the last song. Just come down front after the song is over and say, I'm unsure that I've surrendered my life to Jesus. Will you pray with me? And they would love to pray with you and help lead you to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. As we live out our guiding values, transparent living and uncomfortable grace, we're gonna change the world around us. The more we live like Jesus, the more we'll be leading people to Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for this, uh, these verses in Colossians, God. Thank you that you change hearts and transform lives. Thank you that we get to live and demonstrate the same grace that you've demonstrated to us. There is not a sin on this planet that I have not been forgiven for. Help me demonstrate grace to other people. Help us to all live transparently. Help us to embrace this culture that you're doing here at our church that you're creating. And help us, Father, become the people you've created us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.